Hello, I am Steven Satterfield. I am the host of Netflix's High on the Hog and the founder of the food media company Whetstone. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm working on a book. So I'm Mm. in this like mountain house, not where I would ordinarily be. And um, I love the song Birds, but I'm just realizing. I hope y'all love it too. Anyway, we love it. It's great. We were talking about that. (laughs) Okay, cool, cool. You founded Whetstone. What is Whetstone for people who aren't familiar? Whetstone is a print magazine and media company um, dedicated to global food origins and culture. Many people have a, a passion for food, but not so many people dig into it as deeply and even fewer make it their life's work. So how did you realize that this was going to be what you spent your life doing? You know, I was around food early in life. My dad um, is a great cook. My grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother, uh, my dad's mother-in-law, they used to cook together, which is, um, you know, for whatever people think or... um, sort of giggle about the relationships between um, in-laws. In in my family's case, it was a kind of sweet um, thing for us to get to bear witness to. And then, you know, when I was a teenager, the Food Network was really had come into prominence. So um, in like the late 1990s, early 2000s, I think watching um, food on television as like a a matter of culture and art um, and exploration was really compelling for me. And um, when I left high school in Atlanta, I decided to just pick a point on a map that was very far away from where I was. I did that. I I moved to Oregon, um, to the University of Oregon, and I ended up moving to Portland and then uh, enrolling in culinary school as a teenager. And so that put me on a path of um, being immersed in the the world of food um, from a like professional standpoint, um, the I started off as a culinary student, so um, I thought I would be the next like uh, Emeril Lagasse or Jacques Pepin or something like that. Um, but then I quickly realized cooking for friends and for yourself and for leisure is hardly the same as doing it for a vocation. Um, So then I transitioned into uh, the hospitality program at at my culinary school. The first class I ever took was the introduction to wine studies class. And um, I fell in love with wine on the spot. I was 19 and um, you know, two years later, I had become a sommelier. Do you remember the wine that did it for you? The first wine that you tasted where you're like, I'm going to become a sommelier? Well, I had been curious about wine. Um, so I had a friend, one of my best friends in high school. His dad was a real gourmand. Like, their family were, like, serious gourmands. And um, his dad had a wine cellar. And I remember going over their house for dinner and uh, just being kind of in awe with how long he'd spent in the cellar. Like, like what the hell is he doing down there? <laughs> um, and then, you know, he marched back up with his two special Bordeaux's. And I, I wanted to understand what he understood. You know, I wanted to make sense of the pleasure that he was able to get out of the bottles and just what went into um, the whole realm of discernment, you know, of quality, of price. Surely they cost a lot of money. Um, And so that was planted in my head. And so when I, when I showed up at this um, wine class kind of accidentally, I was like, Oh, this is dope. I'm going to be able to answer that question I had like a few years ago in high school. But because I was in Oregon, geography is a huge part of wine. Um, I had very close proximity to the Willamette Valley, which is basically, um, stylistically speaking, uh, kind of like Burgundy for the U.S. They're both on about the 45th parallel. You know, they're both kind of damp 
and uh, get lots of rain throughout the year. And um, I got to see wine, not as wine, as a luxury item, but I got to see it in the vineyard. I got to see it as an agricultural product. And that made it feel very accessible to me. I was like, Mm. this is wine? Like, it's just grapes? Like, I can't believe I was making it out to be this whole other thing. Like, it's just look at these grapes growing. Um, So, yeah, that was like the beginning of my journey. And um, that was almost 20 years ago. And, um, yeah, it continues to be my greatest joy in life. Is that when you started getting interested in food origins when you were? Yes, exactly. Um, Not instantly, but it came through that thinking. So when my peers were studying, I don't know, whatever people study in college, business, philosophy, psychology, whatever, I was learning viticulture. I was learning enology. I was learning about winemaking, grapes. I was learning primarily about geography. Um, so much of what you learn as a sommelier can be distilled down to um, where something came from, the origins of the grape. And that becomes the central story. And depending on um, the particular place within the point of origin, then we award different tiers of distinction. I started to uh, see some, I thought, not so subtle parallels between um, geography and, and, and terroir, as we call it, um, and our own human origins and the stories that we tell about ourselves and, that, and the assumptions that people make about us when we tell them where we've originated. And um, I actually ended up being kind of disillusioned with the wine industry that I didn't feel that we were being, um, I thought we were being kind of intellectually dishonest. Like there wasn't a whole lot of rigorous thought around land other than um, if the vineyards were of uh, distinction that had been assigned that, you know, 200 years ago with great, um, to great commercial benefit, you know, and, and to the personal benefit of a number of uh, legacy families. And so um, I started a nonprofit organization called the International Society of Africans and Wine, trying to just learn about the the history of wine in Africa, the role of um, African diasporic people with relationship to wine, because, you know, I wanted to kind of look for my own reflection in this industry that it was hard for me to find. And where we ended up landing with it was um, we basically were helping Black vintners get their wines exported into the U.S. And then we would create marketing campaigns um, on their behalf. So I was kind of radicalized with this worldview of being deeply dedicated to food and wine, but only to the degree that I could use it as a way to talk about things that were more real, more meaningful, more substantive than just like what pairs with what or trying to memorize a bunch of vineyards. At least for me, when I first think about like fine wine and, you know, high end restaurants, those are not issues that I I think are kind of like, oh, please forgive the, I don't know another way to say this, so forgive the horrible pun, but like on the plate of what uh, those kind of institutions deal with. I don't, I don't think about, you know, a restaurant as dealing with like origins and justice and history. And you've really changed my mind about that. So I, I wonder... Was that something that was always on the table for you, or did you oh, did you start to figure that out? Um, well, thank you for your openness. I grew up around a lot of Black people and not a lot of money, um, but I was also, you know, around a lot of mixed 
communities and around um, a lot of wealthy white people. And so, you know, I have always had to, um, whether or not I wanted to, be very much aware of my my presence as a minority in um, majority white spaces or, or even mixed spaces. The main thing that it did was to make me feel a sense of um, obligation for people like me who would come behind me to feel more ease in those spaces. And that felt very like innate to me. It felt very obvious to me um, that if I could make things more easeful for people coming behind me, like that's what I should do. You know, I also feel like that's part of the legacy of, uh, of being born in as a black person in Atlanta. You know, we have a very proud tradition of making life better, not just for black people, but in helping us um, reach our democratic ideals and best potential as a nation, like the Voting Rights Act of 1964, for instance, right? That makes us all more free. And, and that makes our, um, our aspirations to be democratic, like able to be fulfilled. And then to your point around fine dining, it's a very um, astute observation. Um, I had this same epiphany actually when um, I had first started this nonprofit. And I realized that um, I was able to get folks to listen to me talk about topics like apartheid um, or slavery or, um, you know, disenfranchisement, et cetera, because our point of entry into this portal was about wine. And so we start off with, the, we're doing a tasting. Oh, this is delicious. Where does it come from? Oh, it comes from South Africa. What parts of South Africa have you been? Do you know the history? And now in this amount of time, I've gotten them into a space where uh, through something pleasurable, now we can talk about things that could otherwise create discomfort. And because of the, the whole way in which um, analyzing wine has been set up to be kind of matter of fact and to come through this um, kind of prism of assessment of, you know, place and elevation and soil and human inputs and et cetera, um, I tended to use this same matter of fact analytical way about talking about who works the land, who harvested those grapes actually, you know, what the um, labor force actually looked like, um, that over 90% of the folks uh, working in this industry were black and, and Kosa people. And uh, there was less than point one percent of these black families who owned any of the land in a four billion dollar industry. These are just facts that we could talk about. And people, to my surprise, they received them like that. <laughs> and and it and that was enlightening for me because then I realized that food and wine um, have a unique capacity um, as a means of both garnering power or disarming power. Do you feel like a meal where there isn't this engagement with the people behind the scenes, where there isn't this engagement with the history of the ingredients? Do you have that same kind of feeling of like, oh, this was a missed opportunity here? No. I mean, that feels a little brutal to me. Okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do want people always thinking more seriously about food, their food choices, thinking about them as a political act as a means of voting each and every day as a means of either strengthening or, um, you know, destabilizing communities. So I, I do want people to kind of um, share this analysis and how they think about their food. But 
I also realized that because of the demands of capitalism and the ways in which our food system is set up, it's not always possible for our ideals to match our meals, Mm. right? And so a lot of it has to do with accessibility for people. And um, a lot of the things that I am an advocate for um, are not possible as wholesale, you know, kind of lifestyle changes and choices. By the way, for myself included, you know, as someone who travels and goes to give talks and works on productions, like sometimes we just need calories to keep it moving. But, you know, that being said, I do hope that we are are reaching a kind of groundswell of consciousness around food where people are starting to look at origins and provenance um, as a means of our own um, kind of familial and community sustainability. And I think that's one thing in particular um, with the onset of COVID and and watching um, the kind of instability at at grocery stores um, and the various scares um, due to supply chain shortages and, and things like that. You know, I think it really is clarifying for people about what does it mean to have access to food, really, mm-hmm. you know, and especially when shit hits the fan. Well, so I, I'm curious about that. Uh, you know, talking about the accessibility piece, talking about actionable, practical things that people can do. What are some practical things that people listening should do to be more thoughtful about this and to start to affect change in, in the food industry? Well, the first thing that you can do is you can support um, a local farmer or a local farm. You can do that at a if you're able to go to a farmer's market or if there's a CSA because, you know, shopping from um, basically the person who grew the food or one one step away um, is a very disruptive thing to do for our collective health. You know, we have some of the worst health care in the world, in the United States, and this is not just from the perspective of a developed nation, it's that we spend the most and we have some of the crappiest. And that inefficiency is really driven by um, the front end, or sort of the, the, the wide funnel of folks coming into the healthcare system. And the reason that they're, they're matriculating into this system is because uh, 60, 70% of the time, diet related diseases that are otherwise totally preventable. Why is that? It's not because folks are necessarily going to, I don't know, 7 Eleven and drinking 60 ounce big gulps every day. It's because the sugar lives everywhere in everything we drink, every granola bar, every um, fruit juice, everything. And this it's subsidized um, through lobbyists, i.e. through our own tax dollars, um, the, the agricultural industry, the dairy industry more broadly, we don't really understand that we're paying for those subsidies down the line with our hospital bills, um, with the care or lack thereof that we receive through these really bloated networks when no one, of course, wants to pick up the bill. And so I really believe that things that we can do to interrupt that cycle are actually really powerful. And they not only do that, they keep money inside of our local community. So not only is there the health benefit, There's tighter loops around the community benefit. It's even more profound um, to to look at supporting black farmers. Um, You know, when you look at uh, the ratios of black farmers in in the country a hundred years ago, we're in the millions, right? Now we have less than 30,000 black farmers in the U.S. 
And this mm-hmm. is a, a land loss story. Um, and again, relatedly, this, this becomes a story about economic health, community health, financial health. Um, and it all tracks when you look at um, income disparity and, and wealth disparity among Black folks. Um, it's honestly as bad as it was since Reconstruction. Food is related to everything. It is a powerful means of of organizing ourselves. It's a, uh, it's a powerful means of um, intersectional organizing. Again, because we can all gather around our own traditions. It is a way for us to better understand ourselves, where we've come from, because the story of food is the story of people, the story of humans. And as we see ourselves in history, then we are more able, in my opinion, to make rooms room for others in history and in society because the, the trouble that we've gotten into around story is that the story is owned by whoever's telling the story. Hmm. And when that person's telling the story and they omit or forget other people who were central in the making of whatever the tale is that's being told, then that type of erasure has real material consequences in the world. I was going to say this feels like a a perfect segue into your work on High on the Hog. And I think that one of the really powerful parts of the documentary series High on the Hog is going back and seeing these huge contributions and the actual history of African-American cuisine in the United States and globally. It seems like telling that story really ties in with what you're talking about here of, of maybe being able to walk back some of that erasure and put some representation there and show people the actual history so that we can change things going forward. You, you nailed it. I mean, that's what, that's really the work, you know, is um, correcting the historical record. And also um, the his, history lives, history is alive. And so the problem with talking about history like it's over is that it makes us feel like we solved everything that was problematic from a historical context. This is why what's happening in Florida and the schools there and not being able to have access to books that can teach us our history is um, really dangerous. And it's being done with a lot of intention because of the implications of you know, omissions of certain people and events in history. And you can see mm-hmm. the ways in which the omission of the of the people and the events can now be used to tell a new kind of story with um, new heroes who do virtuous things and not be distracted by... Um, all of the naysayers and skeptics and negative people who want to make you feel differently about the heroic people and events in these permitted works. You worked on the Netflix documentary series High on the Hog. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with that, what's, what's that? Yes, so High on the Hog, as you say, Netflix docuseries based on a book by Dr. Jessica B. Harris of the same title, High on the Hog. Um, it is a book that tells the story of African-American people through food. And so we begin in Benin, West Africa. We make a voyage to the New World at a point of entry in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, From there, we move uh, to uh, Virginia and Monticello, Um, where we talk about the U.S. presidents and their role um, both in the the slave trade, but also um, in the culinary history of the country as well. And then the fourth episode finishes with our emancipation in Texas um, for a Juneteenth celebration. And that's where the show... Um, picks up for the second season. So sort of at our... Oh, yes. I'm so excited about this. Tell me what's going on with the second season. I can't wait. Yeah, well, 
um, we're kind of carrying carrying on that journey. And so we're where we've left off. And if folks don't know about Juneteenth, um, this is uh, a holiday um, from Texas where the last enslaved African-Americans found out um, through a mandate uh, signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1863, I believe, uh, in January, um, the news finally traveled to Texas. And so upon emancipation, um, we now celebrate this holiday every year on June the 19th. And for the purposes of our story in High on the Hog, that's where the first season kind of caps. And now we're moving into the second season um, into a place about migration and what happens when free Black folks are on the move. So we talk about uh, the historical the historical period of Reconstruction, uh, about the Great Migration, about Jim Crow, about the Civil Rights era, and we kind of bring it home to modern day. I found a lot of joy in language and in words and phrases, um, not even just professionally, just personally. I, I love to kind of collect, okay, that's an interesting little idiom. That's a fun word and a phrase. And I think something that's very fascinating as an English speaker is how there are so many other languages that have kind of been subsumed into English. When you when you start to look at where the words come from, you discover it's from everywhere. You know, um, just a small example, right, is like, you look at the word banana. Oh, where would banana come from? Oh, that's a word from Senegalese Wolof. You look at, you know, phrases that we use. They're from France. They're from Germany. They're from all these different places. And it strikes me that you seem like you feel a similar joy in identifying the food origins and how these pieces that we take for granted actually come from all over the place and, and the stories behind them. Is, is that true? And if so, I wonder if you could maybe tell me something that's kind of delighted you when you've learned about it. I think in another world, I would have loved to have been like a linguist and, and really studied words for the same reason. It's just so revelatory, you know? Um, and, you know, I mean, as far as origins, like just to stay with the banana, the thing about bananas that a lot of folks in the U.S. miss is that we have one shitty banana, the Cavendish, it is ubiquitous, it's fibrous, it's bland, it's crappy, it's ugly. And yet this is what we think about when we think about bananas. Mind you, there's hundreds of varieties of bananas all over the world. And we are subject to this one banana um, that was cultivated in some aristocratic garden in England hundreds of years ago, bred for its hardiness, and now is giving all bananas a horrible reputation. <laughs> um, you know, not to mention all of the diseases that the monocropping has caused um, along the way. So like, you know, looking at something like the banana, we can learn about everything from like, you know, um, the actual origins. We can learn about capitalism. We can learn about agriculture. We can learn about the the, mon the British monarchy. We could actually even take it and talk about the the United Fruit Company and um, you know Panamanians and Ecuadorians who uh, lost their lives in building up this banana industry um, and the creation of the Panama Canal and the roles that bananas played in that. So you're looking at movement of people, of plants, of information, of ideas, of technology, and food gets us there. Always food gets us there every time, as, as the origins of language can also answer a lot of questions too. I love that. It's also, I will say, as someone who wasn't familiar with all the history of, of the banana and that there were all these different varieties, when I moved to Los Angeles and a neighbor had a banana tree and gave me yeah. one of their apple bananas and I tried it and I said like, 
I can't even believe this is the best banana I've ever had. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's because you're eating the worst. But you're eating a banana that is only qualification is that it ships well. That's it. That's why we eat that banana. And then I had an apple banana. And now I'm like constantly knocking on their door like, you got any more apple bananas? Any apple bananas, right? Um, See, the the beauties of uh, supporting local food systems that support uh you, too. Well, Stephen Satterfield, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for making the time to be here and um, can't wait to see what comes next with High on the Hog and Whetstone and all of your other projects. I will be watching and cheering you on. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it.